Hello, everybody. Hey, Matt. Hi, Andrea. How are you doing? Oh, all the better for a foot of snow. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay. Oh, is that up in New Hampshire? Yes, Harrisville. Okay. <laughs> I'm at no snow here in Florida. <laughs> Just oh, cold. that's good. I'm glad Peggy, there'd be something <laughs> very wrong. That could happen. You never know. So just a little bit chilly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. I was looking at my my in-laws are in interlocking and uh, interlocking, yeah. Yes, yeah, they yeah, have cold. So <laughs> did you come down here last week and help them, like you said you mentioned? Actually, we're coming down, we're heading down um uh tomorrow. Yeah, it's, oh. today's Wednesday, tomorrow. We're oh, gonna, okay. We're gonna, well, happy um, trails. Happy yeah, trails. thank you. We're gonna, yeah. We'll be driving all day tomorrow, so and uh, be socially, socially isolating from them, <laughs> still helping them somehow, so <laughs> Mas yeah. masking up, so. Yeah, I get it. Looks so, uh, we have a number of people joining on Peggy who are part of the uh, Relabel team. I see Tony and, uh, um, hey, Tony. Tony. Hey, Peggy. Hey, Wendy. Wendy's hey, here. Wendy, how are you? <laughs> and Denise, hey, Denise. Oh, yeah, Denise is here, huh? And Beth is here. Oh, there's Beth, all right. <laughs> Hi, Matt. You look like you're outside. Are you outside? <laughs> no, I'm not. It'd be pretty cold. It, this is my uh, sunroom. This used to be the exterior of the house many, oh, many years ago. Okay, that's what threw me. Okay. About 80 years ago is the exterior of the house. So. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't believe you were sitting outside, but that that's what it looked like. <laughs> I would, yeah, I would not be looking so comfortable right now. So. Right. <laughs> Good to How see much you, snow did you all get there? We only got about, um, we got four inches. Actually, it was oh, a good amount, four inches, yeah. but it, a lot of it's melted. Oh, okay. We Ford got about is five. waiting for the rest of it to melt so you can metal effect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Tony agrees with that. Yeah. yeah. This was such a uh, spring inducing topic. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So. <laughs> Actually, I might have a picture of Les in this presentation. We'll have to see. Hey, Les, I see you back there. <laughs> oh, gee. There's Sarah Lee and her daddy. Hey, Hi. Sarah Lee. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, Mr. Madison. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Madison himself. <laughs> Double trouble. <laughs> Right behind me on the back. Just a black blob with the, with the bright lights behind me. Oh, hello, hey. That's uh, John Kelly, Matt, that uh, just joined in. He's up here in uh, the Leesburg area as well. So we were having a chat yesterday by uh, a Zoom meeting, and I suggested he might want to, you know, get on this and see what we're doing down in Montpelier. So. Oh, that's great. Well, welcome, John. Glad to have you here. Hey, Matt, I'm up in Beantown with Emily. Hi, Emily. How are you? Good, oh, well, uh, how are you, Matt? Good to see you. So... Yeah. Thank you so much for that book. I've been looking at it. So oh, good. <laughs> All right, we got we got a good um, amount of folks who've assembled. Looks like everybody that registered just about is on. So um, I'm recording this in case anybody needs to uh, jump off and you're not able to hear the the whole thing. <laughs> But um, and we'll send you a link after the uh, the meeting. But um, what we um, we'll give people a few more minutes to uh, to come on. 
Uh, but at the end of it, I'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the project relabel, where um, we have a number of folks that are helping to relabel the actual the units that we're actually talking about today. And uh, this has been a um, uh, real with the units being available, it's made this lecture a whole whole lot easier to put together. So, is this the, the what I'm going to be talking about today is the front yard, of course, and the excavations there. And these are excavations that were done back in 2005 to 2007, so um, about 15, 15 years ago, and uh, brought back a lot of good memories uh, looking at all the photographs. So, but um, well, we, we will go ahead and, uh, and get started. It's 12 o'clock right on the nose. And uh, like I said, we're recording this. What I'll do is I'll go ahead and share screens. And um, if you all could um, uh, mute your line, just in case the dog starts barking or something like that, I've muted on a, on a couple of folks. So, um, and uh, like I said, I'm recording this, this uh, presentation so we can always, um, uh, uh, I'll, I'll send you the link to this afterwards. Um, if anybody has any uh, questions, you know, feel free to unmute yourself and jump in and uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. So I'm gonna share my screen here and make sure I'm sharing the right one and go to the PowerPoint and present. All right, so what I wanted to uh, talk with you all about today is the excavations in the front lawn. And these are the excavations that allowed us to do the restoration of the front landscape back in 2008 when we opened up the restored main house. And we did about three years of excavations on the front lawn, you know, figuring out where the fence is and, and the carriage road. But really, it's been, um, you know, there were excavations we had done before on the, on the portico that helped understand what was going on with the front lawn. And then excavations we've done since 2007, when we finished the front yard excavations, have actually allowed us to go back and inform some of the things that we found. So what we've learned with these landscape excavations where, you know, we're, you're not looking at like a single site, like, a, like a, you know, where I'm pointing right here, the duplex. Uh, but you're looking at an entire landscape. Is it really? Uh, it it, it need, you need to, in order to understand what you're finding. Is you really have to? Um, it's a multiple season set of excavations, and the more you excavate across these larger landscapes, you know, in the front landscape we're talking about 20 acres. Uh, the more you see how all these sites are related to each other, and it allows from for some really exciting. Um, and very detailed finds to be made. Now th for the front lawn, the reason why we <clears throat> started these excavations is with the restoration of the main house. We, um, uh, if, all, if anybody remembers visiting Montpelier before 2007, uh, the DuPont house had a very different driveway configuration. The driveway used to come up to the front of the portico. And during the restoration, we, um, we realized that the, um, the grade out front was about two to three feet lower um, in, in 2002 than it was back in the Madison era. And what we were able to figure out is in the 1840s, there was a good amount of grade that was cut down out front. And that was used to cover the old 1820s Madison fence line and road. And so with the restoration, what we wanted to be able to do was to restore this to the uh, Madison era. Uh, so visitors would approach the house in the same way that, you know, Madison and, and the enslaved community would have known uh, the house. And what we had to go off of was, it was this early watercolor that showed the front a fence further out in front of the house and then what appeared to be a carriage road where this, you know, enslaved mother and her daughter are walking um, out in front of the house. But in the course of these excavations, what we realized is that you know, not only did we have to, you know, we we're wanting to try to understand the Madison era landscape, but we also had to understand the 1880s landscape as well. This, this, you know, mid to late 19th century landscape changes that happened at Montpelier. And putting all these changes together, we were able to figure out what happened, you know, with, with this landscape and, and, and how it disappeared and, and what it looked like originally. So um, for, the, for the front, 
front landscape, of course, what dominates that today is the front fence. And this fence runs from what we call the Boxwood Grotto. And this is over um, uh, towards the visitor center side of the, uh, the main house. The visitor center is just off this three-dimensional reconstruction of the 1820s landscape off to the right here. Visitor center is just right over there. It runs from the grotto all the way over to the temple. And what we're able to figure out with these um, excavations in the front uh, lawn with a fence is these two features, the grotto and the temple, were connected by this fence, but they are also symmetrically linked to the center axis of the house. And so, uh, of course, you all have, many of you all have taken part in the excavations of the, the pie and the lay and the grove that we, we did in 2017, 18, and 19, where we were able to figure out these planting screens that align themselves not only to the house, but also the, the, uh, uh, the grot boxwood grotto and also the temple. So there's this you know, major set of landscaping that happens in the 18 teens where the renovations of the house that allow the wing where the enslaved workers add the wings to the house, um, add in the front doorway. There's even more landscaping that happens out front here. And these excavations on the front lawn provided us the information on these. I mean, there, there are no written records about these landscape changes. Um, and so it was all provided by the archeology, span similar to what we found in the, uh, in the back lawn. So, um, I'm going to switch to a kind of a different view of Montpelier for some of y'all that remember our pre-GIS days and we were doing things in AutoCAD. You'll uh, remember this map right here. I was trying to do this animation sequence in GIS and um, I don't quite have all the landscape features in, in, that, in, in GIS yet to be able to do this. So I'm relying on an older sequence I did about 10 years ago. And so this shows um, the, the mansion uh, sort of in the middle here. Here's the back lawn. The formal garden is right here. And this is the front carriage road as it was re we restored it in 2008. And the excavations that we did in this area to figure out you know, how, what this landscape looked like. So what happens in the, um, in the 1840s after uh, Dolly Madison sells the property is this is when all the slave quarters, the, these buildings in the South Yard are raised. They're taken off the landscape. And the next step that happens is the front carriage road is brought up to the front of the house. And when this happens, there, we've got a couple of period photographs that show this. You can see this carriage parked in front of the front portico. And one thing you'll notice is the grade does look lower. It's, it, it had been lowered by this time. And there's a, um, a period account that talks about um, the changes to the front landscape occurring during uh, Monsignor Thornton's time which would have been in the 18, late 1840s when um, uh, uh, Benjamin Thornton buys the, uh, buys the Montpelier property. And so what he arranges to do is he takes, in order to bring the driveway up to the front of the house, is he um, has his uh, enslaved workers uh, break, take the grade down in front of the, in, right in front of the portico and then take all that soil to cover over the old Madison era road that's out here. And in these pictures over on the right, you can see what the grade was in 2005. You can see that it's quite a bit lower. It's all the way to the bottom of these uh, columns. And um, what, uh, what Thornton arranged to have happen is he brought the driveway up to the front of the house, but then brought the, uh, um, the, the steps all the way down to the base of this driveway. And, and in effect, what he, how he changed Montpelier is he made it into a, um, uh, a neoclassic, neoclassic Romanesque inspired uh, building to more of a Greek revival style appearance of building with you know, these much longer columns and uh, which made it more of a dramatic effect for the, for the, for the uh, linearity of these columns. And they also arranged that the house stuccoed to make it look like it had been built of marble. In fact, when Civil War soldiers, Confederate soldiers visited Montpelier and described it, they talked about it being you know, either marble or granite at the time, where you know, hiding, hiding underneath all that stucco, of course, was, was all the brick as it appeared during the Madison era. So when we um, you know, started to, uh, you know, what, and what happens to all this soil is they use the, the grading in the front of the portico 
to basically cover over this road trace from the Pinale all the way up until up into the temple. And, we'll, and I'll, as I'll go into what we discovered, there's, there's some, you know, um, complications in terms of what they did is in some areas, they lowered the grade here in front of the portico and over in this area. And we're able to figure out clues to this from some of the, the fill sequences we found in the, uh, in the front yard. So with, with the front yard, what we've, um, uh, what, with the lowering of the grade and bringing the driveway up to the front of the house, they also um, made changes immediately in front of the house. And I talked about this a little bit when I gave the presentation earlier this summer on the portico. In order to have this not just be a, you know, a, a, a subsoil um, surface in this area, what they did is they put a brick paving in all across the front of the house. This is in the 1840s. And if any of you all remember visiting Montpelier before 2004, there is this brick walkway underneath the portico that extended to the uh, to the south and then also to the north. And so all of the, and then and then also what we found when we did the excavations in the front lawn is we looked at the um, at the at the uh, uh, at the boxwood grotto to the south here, and we found the same paving was in here. So there's you know this unified set of landscaping that occurs in the 1840s that literally runs from the grotto all the way up to the temple in the same way the fence did. But in, in this, but at this time, what they did is they covered over the old Madison Road. So, you know, in the, in the 19th century, especially the early and the mid 19th century at two different points, you've got some really massive landscaping that occurs to the front of the house. And, it, you know, all this is done by enslaved labor with, uh, you know, um, uh, hand tools with digging sleds, wheelbarrows, pickaxes, you know, some very intensive work. And the archaeology revealed, you know, this. And this, this was kind of this, this work that we did to understand what the Madison appearance of the front lawn looked like revealed this uh, work, this, this landscaping from the 1840s. And it was really necessary to understand that, to understand what was going on with the front of the, uh, the house. So, um, and, and all this work, just to remind you that all this work, the, the excavations we did under the portico, the, the, the excavations we did in front of the house, all this occurs between 2004 to about 2007. So we learned, you know, in addition to the work we did in the main house, we learned a uh, tremendous amount about this uh, surrounding uh, landscape. And I'll put this into perspective and in what we're looking at today um, in, in near the end of, of my presentation here. So with the, with the work we did on the front of the house, uh, the goal of this work was to understand, you know, basically to ground truth this 1817 watercolor by Baroness Hyde de Newville, in which she shows this front fence in, you know, in front of the, uh, um, of the, of the, of the 18, um, early, early uh, 19th century plantation, the 1820s uh, main house. And in looking to figure out where this was, I mean, even where to put the first unit, we worked with Alan Brown, who's a landscape historian, and he started looking at the, the, the layout of the grounds and how this, you know, in the early 19th century, how these grounds were laid out. And he had seen something similar at Poplar Forest, where uh, there was several landscape um, uh, treatises of the time that talked about taking the breadth of the house and the breadth of the house is the main block of the house which is 90 feet across and then using that to place the uh, main the, the dooryard gate which is the entrance into the formal grounds and so if you extend out from the front steps where the stairs were in the Madison era out 90 feet he predicted that this gate would be somewhere in this area and when we started opening up units Lo and behold, you know, we, we came across uh, the remains of one of the post holes for the gate. And then in further excavations, what we're able to find is not only that one gate post, but a whole series of fence posts that connect together that um, outline this same pattern of fence posts that's shown in this Baroness Hyde de Newville painting from 1817. So we're super excited. And then what we also found inside of the fence was a very different set of deposits. We started finding all these uh, rounded river gravels underneath all this fill. So there's about, about a foot of fill on top of this Madison era surface. And how we're able to figure out this is the Madison era surface was by the presence of these rounded river gravels uh, and cobbles 
uh, that we located that were buried in the 1840s. And so what we're able to figure out about this fence is that it outlined this, this uh, carriage, paved carriage siding, and then the carriage road out front was a, um, a, a basically a, a red clay road without any paving. And then this paved carriage siding is what allowed the carriages to pull off and then allowed passengers to disembark and then walk up the gravel path, which we also found evidence for up to the front of the portico. And in the process of, of these excavations, what we also found was an unusual planting bed in the middle here that was filled with charred wood. We still have never figured out exactly what that was. And um, for purposes of restoration, we put a paving all across the front here. Uh, it, it, there's, as you'll see with the excavations that I'll show you in a minute, there, you know, there's um, still a lot of excavations that are needed to, to really flesh out the details on the front lawn. This is by no means a a done ex set of excavations and research. Uh, we basically did enough on the front lawn to figure out the fence where the carriage road was um, and allowed the main house to be opened up with this, you know, semblance of the fence and the road there. But there's a lot of other details we there are still left to figure out. And what, one thing that was really dramatic about these fence posts is that um, they're set against red clay subsoil. And I'll show you some of the excavation sequence of that in a second. But when we, um, what really allowed us to identify these post holes were that when the Madison's, the enslaved workers installed these posts, they would char the bottom of the post to harden it from insect infestation. And so when you look into one of these post holes, this is the post hole that's right here. When you look into this post hole, you can see this squared off area right here. That's the location of the fence post that's buried in the middle of this post hole and then it's backfilled around. But what's beautiful about these charred posts is that because they, you know, the outside of it is charred, that charred wood survives, the impression of it survives uh, because it, you know, insects don't eat charred wood. And not only were we able to get the dimensions of these posts, there are four inches by four inches, but also uh, send the, um, the charred wood out for analysis and the paleobotanist will, um, identified the species of the posts as black locusts and then also black walnut. It was a mix. So, you know, with this work, what we're able to do is, you know, flesh out what this looks like. But the details of this, what, um, you know, when you start looking at some of the, the, uh, the details of these excavations, um, it, you know, figuring out, you know, where these posts were took an, a, a, a lot of excavation uh, because, what we're able to figure out is that in the, in the 18 teens, all this area in front of the house had been cut down to subsoil. And then these posts were dug into the subsoil, the post holes were dug into the subsoil and it made these features incredibly difficult to find. And on top of that, you've got about a foot of clay fill that looks very similar. So when you look at these posts right here, of course the red, this is a, uh, from um, GIS, this is the overall map of the main house. Here's the main house. Here's the front path leading up to the portico. This is the, the, um, the carriage road and visitor center is just at the bottom of the map here off the, uh, off the map. So if it, as a, visitors walk up the front carriage road today and then go through the dooryard gate and then go up to the front portico. And these different um, colored squares, of course, are our excavation units. And there's about four different projects that we engaged in. I'll detail each one of these. There was the, the front yard project of 2005 and 2006. And then in 2007, we excavated the um, fence line south and the, uh, the, the, the southern half of the fence line south and then the area of the grotto. And I'll go into each of these different colored projects areas separately. But for the front fence, locating these, po these uh, post holes, what was involved can be seen in two units that I pulled out that um, our volunteer um, relabel crew have started to, to relabel and, and organize into GIS. And if I, I'm gonna switch over to a sequence of the shots from this first unit, um, 1237, and you'll be able to get, begin to see the stratigraphic sequence that we encountered in our excavations. So, um, in this unit right here, this is um, you know the opening up of of twelve three seven, and again this is um, 
happy to get back to the presentation here. 1237 is right here on top of what was a uh, post hole. And when you look at this excavation sequence, this is the, uh, the topsoil after the, after the sod had been skimmed off with shovels. And when you um, started, when we dug through the topsoil, we came down to a layer of, of pebbles. But this first layer of pebbles, remember this is you know, the 2006 uh, surface here, under about two inches of topsoil, what we, start encounter, what we started to encounter was uh, a rocky um, topsoil that was loaded with slag and blacksmith scraps. And then below, and so these are, and, and also 18th century artifacts, which at first did not make any sense whatsoever because we were looking for, you know, we, we had figured out from earlier excavations that we were digging through, we were gonna need to remove the 1840s fill. And you've got this 18th century topsoil that's on top of these 1840s fills. Underneath, and I'll explain that in one second, but underneath this 18th century topsoil that had obviously been redeposited, what we had was this very red clay that was filled with all kinds of gravels. And this gravel fill also included cobbles. And this was from all the soil that had been scraped down in front of the portico and then brought out to the old Madison era fence line and carriage siding and dumped on top of it to, to bury it. Now for this, flipping back to the, to the layer B that had all this blacksmith material, um, when you look at the overall map here, what you'll see is this is, um, again, this is this unit I was just detailing right here with, that has uh, uh, right underneath the topsoil has all this blacksmith material. Some, you know, we, given that it was blacksmith material we were locating here, slag and, um, and uh, clipped iron, we knew that in the 18th century, the blacksmith shop used to be up in this, in the field beside the temple. And uh, when the temple was built in 1811, that's when by that time the blacksmith shop had been taken down and it was moved to the home farm right beside the overseer's house. And this is actually the area that uh, Dennis and, and Tony are metal detecting today. And we're gonna be um, excavating this, this, uh, this upcoming season in 2021 with the expeditions is looking at the blacksmith shop that's not here by the temple, but the one that's down at the home farm by the Madison Family Cemetery. So in the eight, by the 1820s, this blacksmith shop, shop was gone. But in the 1840s, what happens when they bring, you know, lower the grade in front of the portico and bring the carriage road around to the front of the house is, is they also, when they get rid of this road leading to the north that goes to past the, the temple and over to the, over to the ice pond, is they rearrange the road in this area and they have this kind of, um, I don't know what to call it, a spur or kind of an off ramp that went around to the back of the temple that gave access to the ice house. And then this road continues up and actually goes over to the horse graves today. And when they did that, what they had to do, and this is in the 1840s when this grading has happened, they lower the grade here. And so we're thinking this is the spot where they take down this topsoil and then it becomes available to dress all the red clay and quartz rock that they've spread on top of this area. And they bring this topsoil over because they had to remove it, but it's also good fertile topsoil to plant the front lawn. And when we were excavating the area, this um, the shot to the right here is looking towards the, uh, the front carriage road in, the, in this uh, circular dooryard fence right here. Um, this, these excavations we did in 2013, we were trying to figure out whether or not the old, the old Madison era carriage road extended out this way and whether the fence line extended as well. And as you might expect, it did extend. We found post holes all through this area. But when we were doing these excavations, what we didn't find are any post holes in this area. And when we started to find post holes here, they were incredibly shallow. And that gave us the clues that this area had been scalped off. And then also right underneath the topsoil here, we hit this bright red clay subsoil. So this area right here is what was scraped down and then deposited for the topsoil on top of, you know, this, the old Madison Road in the 1840s. So there's some pretty complex land uh, or soil movement occurring in the 1840s. 
And the only way to understand that is going through, you know, all these, these excavations. And then, so what this area looked like in the 1840s, and you can understand, you know, it's a miracle that they didn't, you know, have the road go through the middle of this, this fence line is, uh, but when they get over here, they filled this area here and that preserved the post holes in this area over by the temple. You can see the temple columns right there. So, um, so what, going back to this excavation sequence of these, um, these units. So this, you know, this is again, this is the unit that um, is in the, uh, the front carriage road where, where one of the front fence posts was located. Underneath this redeposited topsoil, this 18th century topsoil that's redeposited in the 1840s, what we find under that topsoil is this red clay with not only quartz pebbles, but also quartz cobbles. And this is all this, you know, clay soil they remove in front of the portico to deposit on top of the old Madison Road. Underneath all that clay, what we begin to find is once we get down to subsoil, is we begin to see areas that are interesting. There's a little bit of charred wood. When we get it down to subsoil, you know, in, in most units like that we're excavating at this level, have it all being red clay, we would assume it was top, it, it was, we were down to red clay sterile subsoil. But what was in the middle of this was this tiny bit of charred wood right here. And we had the benefit by the time we were excavating this unit, we had found a post hole here and another one down here. So we were predicting there should have been a post hole right here. So we started scratching in that, at that little bit of charred wood. And once we poked into that charred wood, a little hole formed and we excavated into that little hole, what we started finding was lots of charred wood. And what this turned out to be was this, uh, the post mold, the actual where the post was, uh, the, uh, and then it was set in the middle of this post hole. And in terms of this unit right here, we ended our excavations at this level, we had we defined the post itself, and you can see it's at an angle, and that's that's because this is at a um, at a curve uh, in the fence line uh, right here. Let me go jump to um, back to this unit right here. This post hole is right here, and you can see how this the this fence curves right here. Well, not only do we have the posts themselves that form this arc. But when you look at this post mold, you can see that it's actually curving on the line. This photograph is taken you know, in line with the units on the grid, grid north of the units with north being to the right. And so this, you know, this was, uh, you know, all these post holes were like this. And in fact, when we started to excavate with um, the posts in this area, one of the other um, units I'll show you an example of is this one right here, 12, um, uh, see that's 1211 right there. That unit, when we started excavating this one, uh, we, we, we were just starting the excavations. This is May 16th. This is the field school in 2006. One of the first units we had opened up. We started uh, taking down the soil in this location. We weren't sure where the fence was. Uh, we you know, took off the, uh, the sod, took off the topsoil, Layer B is when we started to encounter, you know, all this slag and, and, and bits of clipped iron from the 18th century blacksmith shop topsoil that had been hauled in and deposited on top of this red clay filled with all this, um, this quartz uh, gravel and cobbles. And then once we got through the clay and the cobbles, what we got down to finally was a transition to subsoil. And then we hit what we thought was subsoil. And uh, since we didn't know where the fence was and there's no obvious post, we thought we were done with this unit. In fact, we, in fact, we were so secure we were done with the unit that we even drew the profiles for the excavation of this unit, which signaled that it was done. But once we started finding all these, um, the fence line, and I'm gonna jump back to this 1211, you know, we had found all these fence posts right there. We decided to revisit unit 1211 and when we did that, uh, let's see, I'm getting back to this. When we did that, what we um, started to look for was, you know, opening up D2 is we noticed 
that uh, when we started to go into the subsoil is there is a little bit of charred wood there. And sure enough, just as the pattern was, once we started digging around that charred wood, what we found was the post mold for the fence. And once we found the post mold, then what we were able to do is successfully begin to find the post hole itself. And what in excavating these post holes, what we realized, you know, normally when you excavate a post hole, you know, when you're digging through, like you're, if you're doing this in your yard, for example, you'll dig through the surrounding soil, the top soil, put it into a pile, install your post, and then push all that soil back in the hole. And so if you did a, a plan section of that, that area where you did the post hole, you'd see the top soil all mixed in with the red subsoil and you'd be able to identify where the post hole is. For these posts that were excavated here in the 18, 18, uh, the 1811s through 1812 period, what we found is, is you know, defining the post hole, the post mold where the post was is very easy. It was filled with charred wood, but the surrounding area where the post hole was, was just impossible to define because what Madison had his slaves do in the front yard is cut the soil down uh, where the fence was gonna go to lower the grade in front of the house. And then once that was done, that's when the post holes were dug. So basically what's being thrown back in that post hole is the same kind of surrounding soil as the subsoil. And it's only by texture that we were able to finally be able to see you know, the, uh, where the post hole itself was. And in this case, there was, a, there was sometimes there were small pockets of you know, other soil that would get mixed in. Like, for example, right here, it's a tiny pocket of, of, uh, of uh, loam topsoil. And then there's your post mold right there. But finally, what, we're, what we were able to do was to get down to the bottom of this post hole itself. And then in the process of excavating this out, what we're able to do is be able to see, you know, the post holes are quite large, they were quite deep. And um, I'll, I've got a better example of this, but they were also dug by an auger. There are these circular impressions in the bottom that indicated that it was an auger. So the excavations, suffice to say, in the front lawn were a bit of a nightmare to look at this fence. Not only did we have all this fill to dig through that was, you know, a red clay fill on top of a red clay subsoil, but then also uh, once we get to the post hole, it was filled with red clay. Now, one thing, and going back over these photos that I just noticed, um, uh, let's see, it's this one right here, this is pointing north. You'll notice this slightly curved area right here. This, this is the post hole itself. When you go back and look where this, feet, this unit is, MT1211 on the map, and you see the MT1211 is right here. This curved area where the carriage siding was, that curved area right here is the beginning of the scoop out for the carriage siding. And, and what, um, what, you know, if we ever go back to excavate the front lawn, you know, this is something we're, we really were gonna wanna look at is, you know, investigate more of you know what that carriage siding actually looked like and when we restored the front of the main house what we did is we buried all this back so all this archaeology is still there waiting to waiting to be discovered and you notice there's a lot of units here i mean it took a lot of units to figure out where this fence was and where the um where the uh, carriage siding and the carriage road was and now I'll, I'll the some of the better examples of the carriage road were found in um the, uh, uh, the, the next season in 2007. And this, this unit right here, this, this, this post hole right here, you can actually see these auger holes very nicely. These are two auger holes that intersect. And these were a, uh, about an eight inch auger that was used to auger out these post holes in the 18 teens. And Madison um, actually uh, writes about, you know, using these kind of augers and uh, uh, that's, would love to find an example of an auger, like a soil auger that was used for this, just for interpretive purposes. But what we found when we did the excavated, the post holes that we did excavate is at the bottom of the post holes, we found evidence for this kind of augering. And we haven't seen the evidence for these augers in any of the other fence lines. So it seems to be something that was very specific to the front fence. 
Now, go, moving on to the, um, to the fence, this fence line to the south, uh, once we found the front carriage road and the carriage siding, the next season, what we wanted to do was to figure out where this fence went so it could be restored all the way back to the visitor center. And so um, it was a rather ambitious season to, to do this in a single season, but we're able to do it mainly because all these post holes are all, we're all seven and a half feet in separation and we're able to lay out our units in such a way where we could discover them. And the trick became figuring out where the fence line ended. And I'll get that, get, get down to that, down at the, uh, the, the, uh, the fence line grotto down in this area. But the first part of the season in 2007, we made a very important discovery of not just the fence line right here, but also of the, um, of the uh, carriage road itself. And you can see, uh, many of y'all probably have seen this picture before. Here's the uh, post holes right here that we've uncovered. And then one of the archeologists is pointing to a set of linear depressions here that are actually the last set of wagon ruts that were pressed into the carriage road before all this bar was buried in the 1840s. So what we found was this incredibly well-preserved remains of the carriage road itself, which was basically a, a, a rutted muddy track that went in front of the house. And that was the whole point of this page, paved carriage siding in front of the, uh, of the dooryard gate right here. And in excavating this area, one thing that we found was in several of the posts out here is we found evidence for two different posts in the same hole. You can, you can see it down here, the, the charred wood that's down here is a, is a post that's in a different position than the post that we found the wooden remains of right here. And there is a clue to why there would be two different posts in the same hole from an 1830s uh, print of the main house. And what this shows is, this is a, um, a print by uh, Prudholm that was done after the Baroness, Hi or, I'm sorry, after uh, the, the uh, John Gadsby Chapman painting that was done in the 1830s. And what he shows is the front fence running all along in front of the house. But when you zoom in and look at this, what you'll notice is, is you get the nice pickets here, with, which where you have the dominant pickets where the posts are in between. But when you blow up this section, what you see is not a picket fence, but what appears to be a, uh, a, a, um, a rail fence. So it's posts with rails. And what this made us think of is whether or not there had been a repair to this fence. Remember, these palings would have been in front of the rail because there's a rail behind each of these white posts, there's a rail that holds these palings in, pa in place, but over here, there's no palings. There's no slats in the fence. It's just these rails. When we looked at, started looking at some of these post holes in the south side of the fence, what we found is, you know, again, there, here's this wooden post that dates later and is superimposed on top of this earlier charred wood post down at the bottom. And what we're able to figure out is that this fence had been repaired in the 1830s and a post and rail fence had been put in place. We, when we restored the fence, we've restored it as a picket fence, but, you know, just it showed that, you know, through time, you know, with, uh, um, with some of the decay of this fence, it was important enough that they repaired it in, it may, even though they didn't have the resources to repair it with a new picket fence or made the decision not to repair it, it was an important enough fence where they put in, uh, put in a new fence line. Now, for um, some of the other areas uh, um, along, you know, chasing out the fence, one of the other discoveries we made to the south was along this series of post holes, we had, you know, this set of posts that were separated by seven and a half feet. We skipped this one because we found this one. We didn't dig every single post hole. But what, and what we found in, in, with these post holes is that in between, there are the, there's sometimes we'd find smaller posts, post holes. And these smaller post holes were separated by 10 feet. And these posts, when, these post holes when we excavated them were much shallower than the 18 teens post holes and they were square. And so what, and the, these post, post holes are only dug to about a foot in depth which doesn't make any sense for a fence that would be able to stand up. And what we're able to figure out is 
that these were 18th century post holes that had been truncated when the grade in front of the house had been cut down. And so what we were able to figure out from these posts that were set on 10 feet in between and sometimes on top of these uh, 18 teens post holes that are much deeper is there was an 18th century fence here, which meant that this carriage road probably also dated to the 18th century. And um, what we, we found when we did the front excavations here is that, that the evidence from the, the, the uh, carriage siding speaks to that, that that was installed in the 1820s. But you know, with the house, the original 18th century house having a different entrance right here instead of centered on the middle of the, uh, the main block with a 1797 addition, there would have been a whole different approach here, but we got clues to it from you know, these earlier post holes that we found in these front yard excavations. And then the final part of the excavations was the um, area to the, uh, to the southernmost part of the fence where the boxwood grotto was located. And in this area, what we were trying to do is chase out the last of the post holes. And we, how we were able to figure out where the last of the post holes was, is we found a post hole here, but none here. And we actually opened up several units all across this area trying to find, we found the road, but we did not find any more fence. And it just so happens where this last post hole is right here, lines up with the boxwood grotto. And <clears throat> later on when we did excavations up by the temple, we found the same pattern up by the temple where the last post hole is just inside the location of the, of the uh, temple. So you get this symmetrical placement of, of uh, post holes. So when you, when you putting all this together, what we're able to do is actually restore the front fence. So this, this is a shot of the area in late summer of 2007, where you've got the, you know, the 1840s carriage road hand, heading up to the front. This is the old, this is the 2001 path that used to lead up to the main house. We took all this evidence together and took down several trees, took out the, um, took out the, um, the road, the, um, this, this 1840s road trace in the 2001 path and basically brought the fence back to life. So what we eventually ended up with was, you know, the landscape as you see it today uh, with, the, um, with the, the 1840s surface uh, buried underneath all of this for future excavations. And so, you know, what all this, um, uh, allowed us to do, you know, putting all this, this landscape evidence together is to not only figure out what the front, front fence looked like, but also understand what happened in this area in the 1840s with the landscaping to, you know, transform the house into a Greek revival house. This is in 1848. And when you begin to look at, um, you know, how all this, um, you know, uh, goes together with um, the work we're doing today is let me bring up uh, yeah this this, this is a um, this 3D uh, model of the uh, of the main house that we're working on with the IMLS grant and I've got the fence superimposed on this area and what you can see is you know this fence of course follows the road and this road leads out to what is today, where today, you know, we found the tobacco barn and the overseer's house, and then the blacksmith shop over in this area. This leads into this whole other road network out on the larger farm, farm complex. But figuring out, you know, this, the, these road traces, you know, how they date to, these are some of these 18th century post holes. These are these square post holes. This one right here, you've got another one right here. And then um, I think, um, yeah, those are the extent of the ones we located. And then there's other ones right here as well that are 10 feet in separation. What we're, you know, even though these, these excavations are done today, what we're doing by, you know, revisiting these excavations and putting all these records into GIS is we're really able to begin to do a, a further synthesis of this research and be able to, you know, place all of the excavations that we've done in context with each other, you know, not only the um, the work on the front of the house, but also to the north uh, up here in the yard here, where we have not restored the fence, and really begin to um, you know not only show what this fence could look like on the landscape, 
but also put it into the context of you know the excavations that we've done. And so what the what the the relabel team is doing right now is they're taking all those photos that are from all these excavation units and um, relabeling them so we can tie them to the individual uh, unit excavation records and then be able to bring these up, you know, in uh, you know in, in one map source. So th this that this relabeling project has just begun, but uh, you know, as we get data, we're going to be able to tie it into uh, into all of this. And um, uh, let me, I'm going to go ahead and stop screen sharing right here and go back to the screen and uh, see if anybody has any any questions. I kind of did a, a, a big dive into, you know, what seems to be some rather obscure information, but when you tie it all together, it really shows how all these sites are related and then even how all the time periods are related in terms of understanding, you know, um, one set of deposits related to the next. You, this is why in archaeology you can't just simply dig down to the 1820 surface. You've got to understand the changes that happened in the 20th century and then in the, the mid 19th century before you get back to the you know the 18 teens. So um, so I don't know if any of Team Relabel has any. Uh, the, the one reason I did this presentation uh, right now is that the Team Relabel is literally relabeling all these excavation records from the front yard as we speak. Um, and so I thought I'd be able to give them some background on what the front yard excavations were and make these layers that you all are going through a little more meaningful. And if anybody's interested in helping out with this project, I've actually created a series we, from earlier videos that we've done, I've created a document that compiles all the training videos together. And if you have about two hours to kill, you could go through those and then get a sense of you'd want to join a uh, team relabel. But I don't know if anybody from team relabel has any experiential things they want to talk about from the work they've been doing. I, I'm putting you all on the spot. I should have given you some warning on this. So, and I'm going to get a drink in the meantime. Yeah, Pat. I'll, if you unmute yourself, Pat. I'm not sure I have anything to, um, to contribute, but this year has been interesting. Um, I came in a little late and just caught the tail end of it, but it's interesting that I could see some of the, uh, the unit numbers that I've been working on. So to see how they all tied, tie into this whole big project was really very satisfying. Oh, well, thanks, Pat. Yeah. The, um, one thing uh, I will I'll share the uh, the unit map with the link to this video. There's also a report that goes into the details of uh, these excavations that um, Adam Marshall wrote about a decade ago. Uh, but yeah, these when when you all are when the um, volunteers are going through each of these units um, and the and the uh, uh, the unit cards and photos of the uh, of each of the layers as they're excavated. They also look at a spreadsheet that lists all the site stratum and the site stratum are how we organize all the individual unit strata together so that we know, for example, that 18th century redeposited blacksmith layer, it's the redeposited in the 1840s. All of those layers in the, you know, 120 so odd units that are out there, all those layers, no matter what unit they come from, are given a single site stratum designation. So all that information can be tied together. So when they enter the data in, they also look at a spreadsheet that has the unit and the strata on it, and then what the site stratum is. So they can look that up and look up information on it. So, well, thanks, Pat. Glad that was useful. Hey, hey hi, Carolyn. If you unmute yourself, Carolyn. I was there in 2007, 2008, and 2000, what was it, 18. Uh, and uh, I, I find it fascinating to follow along and now have things digitized and coordinated so that <clears throat> uh, all the things all along the way 
can really be put together um, with everything else. Uh, and I find it really fascinating to have, uh, to see all the progress that you've, you and team and many volunteers have worked on. Uh, you know, I was working in the yard uh, in Dolly Madison's midden where we found lots of neat things, uh, lots of glass, china, nails, charred wood, oyster shells, stuff like that. So it was a treasure trove that I'm not sure exactly when it had been discovered, but I think I was there in October of 2007. Uh, I wasn't sure just how long before that it had been discovered. Yeah, we, we discovered the Dolly's Midden. So that part of the excavations in the front yard were in uh, the summer of 2007. And at that same time, uh, we had discovered Dolly's Midden, which is on, to the north of the main house from um, a, some utility work that had been done. And after three seasons of digging in red, sterile red clay, what we collectively decided is, is that we were gonna dig in units where there are just thousands of artifacts. So we went from you know, digging in units where we'd collect sandbags full of quartz rocks to units over in Dolly's Midden where we'd collect sandbags full of artifacts. So it was just absolute catharsis for, for the crew in terms of being able to actually open up a unit and have um, artifacts coming out of it. There's a, a great picture of you, Carolyn, holding a, uh, a, a Chinese export porcelain platter with uh, Megan Vanessa. It's one of my favorite photos. So. One of my favorites. <laughs> thank, thank you, Carolyn. You're welcome. And I'm looking at the uh, the questions. Looks like Terry, you got uh, um, a number of these uh, uh, questions covered. Thank you, Terry. It, yeah, the um, the 1830s repairs. Yeah, there's. Yeah, th those repairs to the front fence, like Terry noted, um, uh, Terry's been interpreting some of the um, the uh, changes that happened in the South Yard, and they seem to coincide. Yeah, I hadn't I hadn't heard I didn't realize I learn things when I hear these talks too because I wasn't <laughs> here in two thousand seven, so I didn't realize we'd identified repairs in the front fence. Mm. It's also the side of the fence that mm. the that lines up so we did excavations a couple times on the paling the paling fence and the post and rail fence that's located behind the south yard and it's where the south yard transitions into where the stable quarter is located and there's a, a couple fence lines back there one of those fence lines is a paling fence and that fence extends from the corner of the garden all the way down to the boxwood grotto which is also kind of the corner of where um this paling fence that matt just talked about lines up um, and that paling fence I think gets taken down sometime in the 1830s mid 1830s probably right around when or just after Mr. Madison passes away and it's replaced with a post and rail fence that's oriented towards the south yard 1829 is when the south kitchen probably stops being used because that's when Nellie Madison passes away so in the 1830s we also think that the remains of that building are torn down and actually put over where that fence line I was just talking about used to be. Um, may have also been when a, when a front porch was added on to the, um, uh, to this, the, um, the, one of the double quarters. So there's a lot happening in the 1830s that we don't often think about or talk about, but a lot's happening on this landscape that's fixing, I think in, in some ways fixing it up and, and getting it ready, even maybe perhaps for sale. But Mr. Madison dies in 1836, right? Like a big thing happens mm -hmm. at Montpelier and you always see in the archeological record that when big modifications happen to landscapes or to houses, it's, it's when the property changes hands or when somebody else starts taking it over. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's a pattern that we see in the archeological record everywhere. So um, we see it here at Montpelier over and over and over again. Um, and, and it's a way that you really can identify landscape change happening. So I think it's interesting that in the 1830s, sometime in the 1830s, we see a lot of these shifts happening around the formal landscape. It's not huge and dramatic 
like what we see after Madison takes over the property from his parents. But we can see it in these smaller places of how fence lines may be getting repaired or changed or fixed um, and, and how that translate, how that may be coinciding with the changes. We even have an account from Paul Jennings in the early 1840s where he writes about how he went back and visited and saw that the um, enslaved community had cleaned up the yard is what he I think is the phrase he uses. So, um, so anyway, I think it's kind of interesting. I, I'd not, that was a neat thing to, to learn. And I wonder how it ties in with some of these patterns we're seeing across the landscape. And thanks, Terry. Um, Andrew, you mentioned you have, uh, referring to fence holes and uh, uh, fence molds. Yeah, the, the, the post holes are the, is the hole that you dig to install the post itself. And then the mold is the actual mold of the post. So it's you know the post rots and then it leaves basically the mold of where it was. And in the case of the front yard, what we had was the front lawn, a fence along the front lawn is when the post rotted, the charred wood remains on the outside and then silts wash in and the, you know, the rotted part of the wood you know, is remains there as well. So that mold is was really key for the front front fence. And often, when we're excavating post holes here at Montpelier with the red clay, the only way you're able to identify that there's a post hole there is where that post, the actual rotten post is, and it's a softer area in the soil. So, thank goodness for post holes. Otherwise, we'd never find or post molds. We'd never find the post holes. So. The neat thing about post holes and molds is that that is the entire lifespan of that fence. Hmm. So the post hole hmm. is the creation of that fence that captures that moment that that fence gets built, right? That date. So, and then the mold of where that post is, that's the end of its, that's that fence's death, right? It's demise, whether it's because hmm. the post is disintegrated or because that post got taken out and more dirt falls in. So you actually have the full lifespan hmm of the post, of that fence post with those two features. It's really neat. Someone had asked about, um, you know, could we tell how old the fence is? That's how we, that's one of the ways that we do it is look at the hole and the mold as the, the birth and the death of the, of that fence post. The, the best kind of post hole, and Terry will second this, I'm sure, is if you have a, if you have a, uh, a, po a fence that's installed in the middle of a yard that has say 10 years of occupation and there's artifacts everywhere. When the, the individuals dig that post hole, they dig through all the, that layer of organic material and broken ceramics, put that aside, put the post in, and then all that material gets mixed into the post hole. So like Terry is saying, you can date when the post was dug by the artifacts that are in, within that. It's, you know, if there's a, 1908 penny in the middle of the post hole fill, you know that post was installed, that fence was installed after 1908. But in the case of the front lawn and other areas, I mean, there, you know, there's no artifacts whatsoever, which shows that it was either installed very early or during a landscaping campaign where the whole area had been cleaned off. You know, all, you know basically all the topsoil had been stripped off and you're down to a red clay and then they, they dug the post, post hole. Yeah, post holes are an archaeologist. Archaeologists love post holes because we find them everywhere, all the time, on all different kinds of sites, and you can learn all different kinds of things from them. So they're really fun. Oh, then Carolyn, yeah, the the original fence, yeah, the the fence that we reconstructed dates to it was probably installed around 1811, 1812. The earlier fence with the square post holes probably dates to the 17. 60s, but it could be the 1790s. Not sure. The only thing we know about that, the fence that has the squared post holes, is it predates the 18 teens fence and it also predates when that area was scraped down in the 18 teens. So whether that's, and I would, I would be, I would put money on that it dates to the 1760s. It's the 18th century uh, fence line. And that's something that would be, um, it, very interesting but challenging to ch chase out. So, <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. Um, uh, this I, I thought this talk was going to take twenty minutes, but uh, it filled up the whole time. So, <laughs> there's a lot, to, a lot, a lot that goes into uh, into post holes. Appreciate you all uh, uh, listening today, and 
Um, if any, I, I'll, I'll go ahead and we're recording this and I'll go ahead and send out the link to this, but also send links to some of the, uh, the maps and then also that document on Project Relabel if anybody's interested in, in joining the team. So, and the Project Relabel team, it's a, it's a fun community. We, Terry got us set up in a program called Slack where, where we can all communicate with each other. So if someone has questions, like if Peggy has a question about a unit that she's relabeling, she puts it into the, into the Slack discussion board. And then, um, you know, Dean or Pat might come in and answer it because it's at 10 o'clock at night when I'm asleep. And then the next morning I wake up and I'm like, everybody answered Peggy's questions, we're all set. So, but uh, we have a good time doing that. So thanks to all of you all helping and thanks to all of you all for um, uh, being here today, so. Thank you, Matt. All right, good seeing everybody. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Matt. Everybody be well. Okay. <laughs> good to see y'all. Oh, bye, Vivian. Good to see you. I'll come back. <laughs> Each one is a teaser. Safe trip to Florida. Oh, thank you, Peggy. Appreciate it. Ne okay. Next, when we are, we're out of COVID, uh, when I go down to Florida, we'll have to... Uh, the, the, the link up yeah. somehow, so get together with the Mannings that would be a fun that would be fun be blast. Yeah. But right yeah. now, the Mannings have asked me what I'm going down next and I'm just yeah. like I I'd love to tell you but <laughs> I don't want to tempt you so if I yeah. if I if we gave the Mannings COVID their kids would come and kill me so and right oh stuff. yeah yeah no <laughs> the day will come the day will It'll come happen. So. yeah but no, they, won't kill, they won't kill you, Matt. They'll make you wish they had. Exactly. <laughs> that is exactly what will happen. Thank you, buddy. In the meantime, we have Zoom, so we'll stick to Zoom. So. Yeah. After we all get our vaccinations. I'm Amen. scheduled for Sunday. For <gasps> hey, Vivian. Oh, you lucky thing, Vivian. Good. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, now, if was, now we'll go and see. Oh, you're not in my county. Then I'll shoot him. Uh, we're still playing vaccine bingo here. Oh God! <laughs> Eventually. Oh uh, yeah. Well, All I right. got my. I've got my. You know, wear the damn mask. Mask. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, good seeing everybody. Yeah. Good seeing you all again. I'll see you next Thursday, a week from tomorrow. You oh, are I'm... doing the ASM Mid Potomac chapter. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Let's talk about that offline, Vivian. Yeah. Thank you, Vivian. Okay. All right. We'll see you then. Okay. Bye, Bye all. Everybody.